Uh, welcome to all. Uh, I am Tom Hardiman, the keeper of the Portsmouth Athenaeum, a nonprofit membership library incorporated in 1817. We are one of 16 membership libraries left in the country and part of the membership libraries group, which is co-sponsoring this event. Uh, so welcome any uh, members of our sister libraries. Uh, we're going to ask as a rule of the road that you stay on mute while our speaker is talking. Uh, and then we're going to unmute everybody for Q&A at the end. You're always free to type in questions in the chat section uh, that the speaker can address later on. Our guest this evening is the Dr. Carolyn Eastman. Uh, who is a professor of history at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, she has also previously uh, teached at the University of Texas. Uh, when I was introduced to her by Karen Alexander 30 years ago, she was the special collections librarian at the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Uh, she is the previous author of A Nation of Speechifiers, Making an American Public After the Revolution. And now she is the author of the wonderful book, uh, The Strange Genius of Mr. O, The World of the United States' First Forgotten Celebrity. So I believe Carolyn is gonna tell us all about that. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom. And I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so that um, you can have a sense, those of you who don't know the Portsmouth Athenaeum can get a sense of what it looks like. Um, so, so thank you everyone for coming and especially during a time in the evening when you could be settling in on the sofa to watch Netflix instead. Um, I especially wanna thank Tom for setting up this talk. Um, the book isn't quite out yet. It's um, due to arrive at any point, but I really wanted my first book talk to take place at the Athenaeum because, you know, a lifetime ago when I graduated from college, I got a job there in this beautiful room uh, working as a library assistant for $6 an hour. And honestly, it changed my life. Um, I really believe that I'm a historian because of my years working at the Athenaeum and, and being surrounded by people working on this wide range of historical research, for everything from genealogy to a history of New England lighthouses or histories of neighborhoods in, in Portsmouth. All of this being surrounded by that kind of enthusiasm really got me started down the path to grad school um, where I made even less money actually. <laughs> so I'll never forget it. It's really one of the reasons why I open this new book of mine with a vignette set in Portsmouth, which I'm gonna to get to in just a minute. Okay, so to get us started, I'm going to introduce you to someone you've almost certainly never heard of. Um, this is an image of James Ogilvy. It was probably created when he was in his mid forties. Um, and a, this was a period of his life when he actually sat as a model for several American artists based in London. At another point in time, it's really unlikely, I think, that, um, that Ogilvy ever could have been as successful as he became, but he had a special genius for a certain kind of performance that resonated during the very early 19th century. Uh, more than almost all of his contemporaries, he had a gift for eloquence. So even though he had come to the United States as a 19-year-old from Scotland, and he had spent the first 15 years of his life in the really unremarkable job of being a school teacher, his eloquence ultimately helped to raise him up and give him a new life beyond the classroom starting in 1808. He made, in the end, a very good living by traveling to almost every corner of the new United States, selling tickets to his lectures, um, which discussed the important issues of the day. So at a moment in time when the United States was truly fractured by political, religious, racial, and social divisions, 
women and men throughout the country gathered together to listen to him discuss some of those questions that divided them. So, for example, he advocated for female education. He considered the pros and cons of dueling. He even discussed suicide in sensitive terms that challenged religious views of the topic. And even though he quickly began charging a dollar per ticket for these lectures, which was a lot at the time, it was about what a laborer earned in a, in a day. He, um, so he, his lectures were really only accessible to those with you know, considerably, uh, conser considerable discretionary funds. Within a year of beginning this lecture tour in 1808, he had become a household name. The press began calling him the celebrated orator, the celebrated man, a man celebrated for his eloquence. So James Ogilvy is probably the earliest and most significant American celebrity you've never heard of. I mean, so much so that the newspapers often referred to him simply as Mr. O. He was that familiar. Uh, he was also eccentric. <laughs> In fact, to say that he was eccentric barely scratches the surface. He had scandalous religious views. He had a habit of telling his friends that he would ultimately inherit an earldom in Scotland. Uh, in an era when few people bathed very often, he was mocked by, as having notably bad habits of personal hygiene. I mean, the fact that he was a, a very well-known habitual user of opium was also just widely known and discussed. Once he became famous, he invested in dramatic and expensive clothing. So for example, when he had attended a party in New York City in 1809, he wore a black velvet suit edged in red over which he draped a black cloak lined with scarlet velvet. Um, and at the same party, dressed in this beautiful dramatic suit. Um, as they sat around the dinner table, he suddenly became overheated. And to the astonishment of the other guests, he pulled off his wig that he always wore in public and began to rub his head vigorously. One of the other guests wrote later, I never in my life was more astounded at this breach of etiquette. Um, so having heard all of this, you might be preparing yourself for a funny story, right? A, a story that reminds us how weird the past can be. And that is certainly how Ogilvy's story was told by really the one scholar who previously paid any attention to James Ogilvy. Uh, in the 1940s, a really wonderful literary scholar named Richard Beale Davis wrote a couple of articles about Ogilvy and in doing so, he really set the tone for how subsequent scholars would treat him. Davis was just a meticulous researcher, but he ultimately found Ogilvy to be eccentric and egocentric to the point of ridiculous. And in the years since, almost every time a scholar has stumbled across Ogilvy, they've turned to Davis's writings and come away with a similar kind of bemusement. So they've treated Ogilvy as sort of a joke of history, as in, you know, look how gullible people in the past were to have admired this nutcase, this opium addicted, narcissistic fool. And that attitude really rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, it flies in the face of everything we learn as historians and everything we teach our students uh, in our history classes. We want to, we don't want to treat people in the past as stupid or misguided or weird or preposterous. People in the past are never one, one dimensional. So one of the things I wanted to do in this book was to unpack and make sense of everything about why early Americans would have found him so compelling. I mean, why didn't they find his use of opium problematic. That's actually a really interesting story that re reveals a lot about a period of time in which opium was seen as a wonder drug and its addictive qualities were not discussed. Uh, I give that a lot of space in the book. 
even his penchant for grandiosity and his claims to be a Scottish Earl and his emotional instability, all of these things gained a depth of meaning and significance beyond what you might think on the surface once I started unpacking them. So to me, one of the hints that Ogilvy was more important than Richard Beale Davis would have it appears right on this page. If Ogilvy was just a joke, why did he count among his friends and supporters some of the most important people in the nation at the time. So Washington Irving, the no novelist, was just one of the people who supported his career and defended him when he faced criticism. Thomas Jefferson, who was president at the time, supported him throughout his career. So did John Quincy Adams and Benjamin Rush, the nation's foremost physician. Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, all counted themselves among the attendees of his talks. And none of these people, you know, tended to suffer fools. And, and neither did the dozens of influential society women who were equally vital to his success, inviting him into their parlors and giving him the imprimatur of their approval. So what I learned immediately when I started this project was that I needed to bring this entire world to life, not just Ogilvy himself. I needed to recreate a United States that for the most part experienced in Ogilvy the first celebrity they had ever encountered. And now not everyone loved him. Some mistrusted him, some hated him. Uh, some felt that he didn't deserve the celebrity he re he'd received, but his celebrity gave people from all these different parts of the country a common place to meet in the middle, a place where they could discuss and debate him. So to study the history of celebrity, I think, is to try to make sense of the people whose fandom pushed him into that position. To study celebrity is to try to understand the beholders. So what they saw in him and, and what they didn't see, you know, the eccentricity, the opium use, all of it il illuminates the aspirations, the assumptions, and the priorities of that time. And, and equally revealing are the controversies and the scandals that erupted around him often spearheaded by people who were resistant to his charms or they had goals of their own. So ultimately, I think this book is just as much a story of the United States during a really fragile period of its history when, when Ogilvy's very celebrity gave all these different warring parts of the United States a place to meet in the middle. So this book is really a portrait of the United States in the midst of invention. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna read a couple of pages from the book's preface, which takes us to Portsmouth, New Hampshire during the summer of 1809. And, and before I start reading that passage, I just wanna remind you where we are at this point. Um, the building that the Athenaeum now inhabits was only a few years old, and it was still inhabited by the fire and marine insurance company that built it. Uh, the Athenaeum hadn't been founded yet. Portsmouth had a population of about 7,000 people, and that made it the 20th largest urban area in the nation, according to the U.S. Census. Um, but, but 1809 had also been a really hard year for Portsmouth, as it had for a lot of port cities. I mean, President Jefferson had instituted a trade embargo against Great Britain in 1807, and that had made the city's trade really come to a halt until just a few months before Ogilvy showed up. And during that time, the docks and the wharves and the shipbuilding trade, all of it had just shuttered for more than a year. So by the time Ogilvy came, Jefferson had lifted the embargo, but conflicts between the two political parties, the Republicans and the Federalists, remained really intense. So even though this image of the assembly house um, where Ogilvy spoke um, gives it the appearance of a harmonious or even idyllic uh, world of the early 19th century. 
I want you to remember that nothing about the United States and the early Republic was harmonious or idyllic. So let me begin and I'll take you to Portsmouth. They arrived early trying to get seats close to the stage. Each ticket cost a dollar, the equivalent of a full day's wages for a laborer, and those able to spend that kind of money wanted to have a good view. They wore their best clothes. Having read rapturous reports about James Ogilvie's performances in larger towns and cities elsewhere in the country, they knew he'd seen bigger crowds and had socialized with wealthier and more stylish people. How would they compare? As they alighted from their carriages at Captain Whidden's assembly house, some found themselves self-conscious of how they might perform for this celebrity performer. Walking upstairs, the attendees could feel proud of the assembly room's elegance, for it highlighted Portsmouth's aspirations. The largest room in the city, it was used for all large gatherings, meetings, dances, dancing lessons, 4th of July banquets, and the ventriloquist who also performed sleight of hand magic tricks. Three decades earlier, the newly elected George Washington had called this space one of the best I have ever seen anywhere in the United States when he made a tour of the nation in 1789. At about 1800 square feet, it featured sparkling chandeliers hanging from high ceilings. Sconces on the walls for additional candles accentuated the gilded wall decorations carved to look like bouquets of flowers. In anticipation of Ogilvy's many attendees, the building's owner had packed the room with benches, easily removed on other nights for dances. Just weeks earlier on the 4th of July, they had decorated the room with a red, white, and blue canopy and the very chair Washington had sat in when he visited, all bringing attention to a full-length portrait of the president. Now, as the townspeople moved inside and walked upstairs to, into the large room, they sought to avoid sitting next to the two or three men who were already drunk. Ogilvy had spent a lot of money lighting the room with more candles than usual, and he would be able to see who in the audience misbehaved, looked bored, or started snoring. The room quieted shortly after seven o'clock as he stepped on the stage. Ladies fanned themselves, trying to maintain the appearance of feminine delicacy in the room's collective heat. They knew already that Ogilvy was tall and very thin, for they'd seen him in town for weeks beforehand as he'd made arrangements for the talks. As they waited for him to begin, he appeared even more awkward, almost cold, despite the room's warmth. He grew still for a moment, perhaps mustering his energy. Would this performance be as masterful as they had heard? Would he have the full range of what he called his powers? In those few moments before he started speaking, the audience seemed to hold its breath. But when his deep sepulchral voice sounded through the room, his body seemed to transform and loosen. Watching the gracefulness of his movements reminded them of what they had read about the great orators of the classical world, Cicero, Seneca, as Ogilvy's physical posture on stage conveyed authority, self-possession, and moral certainty. He began with no preface, none of the usual thanks to the audience, no humble comments about hoping to be worthy of their attendance. He simply leapt into his subject. And here I'm quoting, when we review and analyze our pleasures and our pains, he began looking around the room, even the most vulgar mind must see the scantiness and evanescence of the former and the multiplicity, variety, and permanence of our pains. Evidence of the world's pains was everywhere, he said. Consider the pages of history, a black catalog of corrosive calamities, he continued. So the alliteration of the hard seas in that line cut like cracks of an electrical storm through the room, undergirded by the roll of, of the R's in corrosive delivered in his Scottish accent. Consider too, he said, evidence from our own lives, how many moments of exquisite agony. With that line, some of the audience splashed to il the illnesses and deaths of loved ones, children, spouses, 
As he delivered the words exquisite agony, his thin hand delicately touched his heart, accentuating the poignancy of the sentiment. Moving across the stage, his gestures and facial expressions helped to build the dark mood of the subjects he discussed. In one moment, he reached out toward his listeners and looked at them entreatingly with his blue eyes as if he knew they might resist his argument. Alternately, he might cast his eyes down or scowl with a ferocity that made his eyes appear almost black, forcing his listeners to feel along with him the worlds of suffering he described, those existential pains. A few lines later, his assertion that, quote, man is but a shadow and life but a dream seemed so melancholically eloquent, so Shakespearean, that it raised goosebumps on the arms of the gentlemen and brought several of the ladies' mouths to open unconsciously. Their nervousness had left them and their silence was complete. They had begun to realize that Ogilvy was going to ask his audience to feel sympathy for those tormented by suicidal thoughts, a stunning position that challenged the moral, religious, and legal oppositions to suicide. And with that, they were hooked. Okay, so those are the first couple of pages of the book. And, and I think that those passages begin to evoke one of the things that seems the most foreign about the early 19th century. The fact that Ogilvy became famous because of his eloquence. Um, and, and when they described him as eloquent, they didn't just mean you know, the eloquent, elegant flow of his ideas or the way he modulated his voice. What early Americans saw as eloquence encompassed, uh, uh, um, encompassed a whole range of bodily performances. Um, public speakers had to memorize a catalog of physical postures, gestures, facial expressions, and graceful movements. And that's why Ogilvy had brought so many candles to the room. He knew that people would complain if they couldn't see him properly. So, it, and in fact, one attendee in Philadelphia just a few months earlier had written an angry letter to the newspaper complaining about this, that poor lighting in the room had essentially blocked his view. Everyone knows, he said, how essential it is when estimating the abilities of a public speaker to witness that expression of soul depicted in the countenance. Without it, eloquence has not half its effect. So anyone who wanted to become a public speaker, and, and actually even those who didn't, <laughs> learned a whole battery of talents in school that, make, um, that really look foreign, especially to our eyes. Um, take these images. Um, so this is drawn from a guidebook published in 1806, showing all the postures and gestures and movements required to recite a popular poem of the day. Um, oratory of the time was an exacting and physical performance that brought together a range of skills that maybe only seemed so bizarre to us because we are so accustomed to having such boring public speakers. James Ogilvy might have begun life in very modest circumstances and had, you know, immigrated to the United States to only to have a poorly paid job of a school teacher for a decade and a half, but his eloquence ultimately made him something special. And in the new United States, that mattered more than it might have if he'd remained in the Scotland of his childhood, or even if he'd tried to make it in England. And you can see that in this, um, this excerpt, this detail from the image I just showed you, not only does it show the lines from the poem, like good gods, what price can re recompense the pangs of vice, but it also includes all of these elaborate notations, both above and below the text, indicating, you know, once you compare it all to the text of the book, the very minute shifts in how you hold your hands, how you position your feet, how you move your feet. And then the image itself also has these arrows indicating how your arms are supposed to move in what direction. Um, now, someone who met James Ogilvy in the weeks before talk might well not expect him to be very effective as a public performer. Um, one of his friends described him as 
um, uh, tall, lean, and badly formed. Um, it, it was a probably a physical appearance that was made worse by his laudanum, his opium habit. Um, his his cheekbones high and prominent. This person said his shoulders narrow and round. Indeed, his whole figure is rather ungraceful. But when he speaks, you forget his personal defects. His eye, which is bright and quick, bespeaks the energy of his mind. It is the orator then only that claims your attention and leads captive your every feeling. Washington Irving also painted a similar picture when he created a, a sort of lightly fictionalized version of Ogilvy for a short story. He said, he was a pale, melancholy looking man with a meager, pallid countenance and an awkward and embarrassed manner. But we soon discovered that under this unpromising exterior existed the kindest urbanity of temper, the warmest sympathies, the most enthusiastic benevolence, and best of all, a mind crowded with information about philosophy and literature. And when, when Ogilvy became excited by ideas, quote, the change in the whole man was wonderful. His meager form would acquire a dignity and grace. His long pale visage would flash with a hectic glow. His eyes would beam with intense speculation and there would be pathetic tones and deep modulations in his voice that delighted the ear and spoke movingly to the heart. So, so, so there was something about the sort of unlikely appearance he presented that made his performative dynamism all the more transfixing. As, as his gifts for eloquence began earning compliments, Ogilvy actually started to, to suggest that the goals of his lecture tour went beyond simply allowing his audiences to think about civic problems like suicide or, or um, dueling or gambling. He began to argue that in fact, oratory itself was his goal. He wanted to restore oratory to that station from which so many causes have combined to degrade it. He wanted to advocate for eloquence as, as the advocate of virtue and the adversary of vice, especially at this time and in this country of the United States. He believed that his own style of public speech opened up new possibilities for communication that other more common forms of public speech like sermons or political speechifying or courtroom argumentation, those things could only achieve partially. His unique style of encouraging people to, to think out loud about troublesome civic matters had the capacity to raise the place of oratory in the American Republic and give it a central role in, preserve, in, in preserving the democratic process. So, so Ogilvy argued that only by expanding oratory could Americans really discover its true value to democracy. His performances sought to demonstrate that, that public speech really offered occasions and guidance for a whole community to gather, to think together about matters important to their future, just like uh, as in churches uh, where eloquence encouraged religious reflection and, and fostered communities of faith. So if expanding oratory was his major aim, his second goal was to demonstrate its political significance to a republic. And and I should say that in, in talking about the political importance of oratory, I shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse that with partisanship because, because Ogilvy studiously avoided anything divisive. Um, he avoided talking about partisan politics and he avoided talking about some of the most important issues of the day. So for example, he never gave a lecture on slavery or um, anything being discussed in, in Congress. Um, rather, he wanted to revive the kind of Republican eloquence of the ancient 
rostrum, that is the, the classical world, so that he could bring that kind of eloquence into the only republic still existing in the world. So the very nature he believed of this oratory was important to the nation. Um, and one journalist at least found himself utterly persuaded who uh, this journalist wrote, eloquence in a free state is power and it is power of the noblest kind because it rules the mind of men by the force of reason and allures their hearts by the attractions of virtue. Before the accomplished orator, this journalist continued, the miser turns pale, the tyrant trembles and drops his scepter. So, so oratory was seen as a sort of a savior to democracy. And it was seen as having a real potential for American civic life because it heightened the, the senses and the emotions of listeners in an audience by an almost mystical kind of electric force. So the electricity of oratory um, uh, operated at an individual level as, as each member of an audience visually and orally witnessed the performance. Um, so, but in addition to that individual level, it also functioned collectively as all the listeners together experienced an orator's charismatic energy in mass. So the spoken word could ideally dynamically clarify the feelings and articulate the necessary actions of a group of auditors. And, and in fact, I mean, early 19th century print culture frequently talked about oratory as a force of nature. One writer explained that, and I quote, tones, looks, and gestures are natural interpreters of the sentiments of the mind. They remove ambigu ambiguities, they enforce impression, they operate on us by means of sympathy, which is one of the most powerful instruments of persuasion. Our sympathy is always awakened more by hearing the speaker than by reading his works in our closet. The orator's performance, therefore, and the audience's sort of breathless attention would bind them together in an emotional and sympathetic relationship. Fine oratory generated this sort of electric current among listeners and helped to bind them together as a community and perhaps also as a nation. So, so Ogilvy had this rare capacity to electrify rooms and galvanize publics. Um, one letter to a Philadelphia newspaper described it as a force that actually affected the body. This person wrote, eloquence inveigles both our eyes and ears, and it is only from the operation of this mysterious power on both senses that its whole and undivided attention, uh, sorry, energy can be felt. The mind is lost in a variety of delightful reveries. And when the spell breaks up, we regret that we are incompetent to give to the same sentiment, the fervor, the pathos and energy that the orator exhibits. So that, that profound effect resulted from the dynamism between speaker and listeners. Um, so as Ogilvy gradually shifted the rationale for his lecture tour to argue actually that, that oratory ought to be at the forefront as a democratic mode of communication, merging, it would merge together wonder and reason into a harmonious whole. If, if religious uh, speakers sought to enchant their listeners with the glories of faith, Ogilvy wanted to do the same thing. He wanted to enchant his auditors with the magic of public assembly in a republic and the thrill of finding yourself a thinking person in a room thinking together with your fellow Americans. Okay, so I don't unfortunately have time to uh, tonight to talk about some of the parts of the book that try to make sense of the scandals that erupted around Ogilvy. Um, they're very entertaining. Um, and, and 
there's a crazy way in which these scandals almost never really troubled his popularity and his rise to fame. Um, in fact, in some ways, I think it's those scandals that really allow us to understand the ways that the nation's conflicting views of politics and religion and performance and leadership, all of those things really come to a head in those, in those um, passages. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up this presentation by quoting just a little more from the book by talking about the one aspect of Ogilvy's presentation and his performance that no one ever made fun of. And it's the costume that he wore when he delivered his talks. In fact, hardly anyone ever mentioned it. I found about five mentions of it overall during his lifetime. The very fashionable people who wore their best clothes to attend his lectures simply did not discuss the fact that when James Ogilvy got up on stage, he wore a toga, a toga. I love this so much. Um, so, um, uh, you know, to, um, to those of us who are thinking about togas, I mean, the, this is what comes to mind when I think of a toga, right? I mean, maybe this is a sign of my age, but I think of John Belushi as a, you know, almost incoherent, frat boy in college in the movie Animal House, running around yelling, toga, toga, toga. Um, another thing, though, <laughs> um, I should say, um, Ogilvy's toga did not look like this. Um, it also did not look like this. So this is a statue by Horatio Greeno, done, uh, completed in 1840 for Congress. It was, it was intended to be put into um, uh, the houses of Congress. Um, but when this was completed and it was put up, it was really roundly mocked because nobody in America wanted to see George Washington shirtless. I mean, nobody wanted to see this. And so um, it was quickly sort of shifted out of um, Congress and moved elsewhere. Um, so this is not the kind of toga that, that um, they wore. Instead, I think what you should do is think about this as the sort of the, the toga that people imagined in the early 19th century. Um, the man would have had a tunic on, a tunic that um, came up to his collarbones and covered a bit of his um, shoulder and fell then down, you know, to about his knees. And then over that, the toga was draped on top of it in a way that was intended to look quite elegant. So, uh, I mean, to um, people who are unfamiliar with the, the dynamics of the early 19th century United States, um, nothing might seem more preposterous than the fact that he wore a toga on stage. And yet in all of their enthusiastic accounts, only a handful of people mentioned it. And, and they usually did it in an oblique way. So for example, a London newspaper explained that Ogilvy's quote, delivery derived a peculiar charm from a classical and highly appropriate costume. I mean, that's as close as they got to discussing the toga. One of the very few explicit mentions of the toga actually appeared after Ogilvy's death when one of his many imitators, because there were many people who built their own careers by mimicking the kind of style of Ogilvy, um, one of those imitators actually advertised that he would appear in the Roman toga after the manner of James Ogilvy. So, so even though, you know, of course, the toga would have very different connotations later on in time, um, you, you might wonder if maybe his admirers simply declined to mention the toga because they found it embarrassing. But, but the thing is, is that even his, his most vicious critics, those most likely to make fun of his pretensions, never mentioned the toga at all. So, um, so in the end, Ogilvy's toga actually became really crucial to his public persona as a celebrity orator. Um, it was a costume that was invested with potent meaning for the new nation. This had been the dress of 
the Roman orators, the champions of civic and moral virtue, men who exemplified self-controlled, noble, public-minded manliness. And to Americans, the toga really represented the highest um, of human achievements and the, the republic's you know, most idealistic hopes. So embracing emblems like the toga or Latin phrases, all of this invested your cause with a, the sign of authority and wisdom. The reputations of great Roman orators for possessing noble Republican virtue had remained intact for nearly 1800 years. And so when 19th century men and women adopted those sim symbols lifted from the ancient republics, they claimed to be the true inheritors of that legacy, and they believed the new United States needed that kind of authority. And, and the toga also symbolized manliness. I, the Romans had instructed that the toga would be worn in a way that they, they said would be splendidus et virilis, that is, distinguished and manly. And they insisted that the orator convey masculine authority in his, in his bodily performance. So Ogilvy's use of the toga as his signature costume reveals not just how he, you know, connected his celebrity to a visual emblem, but also how he invested um, his self-presentation with the gendered qualities of self-control and restrained male power that that were prized during this era. Wearing a toga conveyed this range of manly ideals. And in fact, I mean, what I found was that once you start looking, you find togas everywhere in the early Republic, which I get into in much more detail. Um, so, um, so they believed, of course, that wearing the toga was an art that required a lot of practice. And thus, how the orator manipulated the toga with apparent effortlessness in the course of a speech could also exemplify character and experience. Ogilvy was really skinny, but he could disguise that with a robe that would emphasize a kind of breadth of chest and offer an illusion of authority and physical power that had long been associated with manly oratory. And in fact, the Roman writers who discussed how to wear a toga specifically addressed how good speakers could maneuver the toga in the midst of a display so that they could maintain that manliness. So one of them insisted that it was vital to always keep the throat and the chest open, as you see it here in the Wallach image, um, because that would allow your listeners to appreciate the quote, impressive effect produced by breadth at the chest. Um, so the, in other words, the drapes of the toga could disguise a thin and habitually sickly man, man's frame like Ogilvy's and create this illusion of broad chested robustness and masculine dominance early in a performance. And then once the order really began to perform, of course, you know, he, he had to use all of his, his arms, his legs, his energy on the rostrum would then replace that visual image or, or illusion of vigor that he had at the, at the beginning. So, you know, um, once it became impossible to um, maintain the elegant folds of the toga, as you see it in this image, the, the classical greats would advise that you, you find a way to throw the, the toga back from the left shoulder so, because above all, an orator needed to maintain this air, this air of vigor. And in fact, the, the Romans advised that um, you should never throw the toga over the right shoulder because that would cover up the, the, the breast and the open throat. And in fact, they said this would be a foppish and ephemer, effeminate gesture. So these details about the speaker's manipulation of the toga to convey energy and physical presence reveal how explicit and longstanding were these connections between masculinity and public speech. And Ogilvy followed those instructions. I mean, according to one Baltimore paper, quote, 
he moves from one end of the rostrum to the other, throws back his robe, smites himself with his hands, and leaves unpracticed no look or gesture that can assist the imagination of his hearers. So conveying a manly presence was in fact so important that one engraver, when he um, created an image of the actor John Kemble dressed in the, in the toga of his character Cato, um, he actually um, reproduced Cato, um, Kemble's face, but used a well-known muscular boxer as the model for Kemble's body, rather than reproduce Kemble's less appealing actual frame. Okay, so I'm wrapping up now. So you can see in what I've discussed so far that this book tries to weave together biography with a picture of the United States at a particular moment in time. Because in the end, I think Ogilvy's celebrity serves less as the primary subject of the book than as a meeting place where so many elements of early national life crossed. So it draws connections between Ogilvy's very ambitious attempts to build his career and fashion and appealing persona all the way to the ways that his supporters and his lecture attendees sought to reflect back to him their own respectability, their own ability to discern uh, his greatness. So, so viewing this form of celebrity through the people who celebrated and criticized him and seeing the way that this all connected a very diverse social, political, and religious landscape of the early United States, I think gives you this really expansive view of the national culture in the making. You know, focusing on the career of a single individual, I think also gives us glimpses into the effects of celebrity on the self. And one of the things that I do, especially in the very last chapter of the book, is talk about how the, the radical vacillations of public hate and public love um, and the toll they might take on his emotional life, um, the ways that those might be familiar subjects to a 21st century audience, but they were much less common 200 years ago. So, so when Ogilvy um, tried to manage his own health and spirits along the way, um, and when he made choices about how to weather the storm of public scrutiny, it, it really exposed offers us an insight into the culture that he inhabited. And it reminds us of the importance of viewing the triumphs and the survival strategies of people in the past on their own terms. Um, and so I know that I focused tonight on a few things that might seem to paint a picture of the past as a foreign country. I mean, the fact that Ogilvy wore a toga, that no one seemed to mention it, uh, a world of in which oratory required these sort of athletic gestures and postures, um, audiences who believe that great public speech could electrify audiences and guarantee a democratic society. All these things seem maybe a bit strange. But I also want to remind you um, about the parallels to our own world. I mean, the ways in which celebrities in American culture have now risen to the highest pol positions in politics as well as culture the ways that American society remains fractured by political, religious, and cultural divisions, and, um, you know, and remains divided even as we try to find ways to bridge those divides. And even the ongoing problem of opioids in American medicine and beyond. I mean, what I found in the course of developing this book over, you know, multiple drafts and conversations with my colleagues was that the more I tried to make sense of the contentious world of the early 19th century for readers, the less any of it seemed very strange. I, I mean, I sometimes worry that I'm never going to enjoy a project as much as I've enjoyed researching and writing this one. But I think that along the way, my, my real delight in all of these subjects opium, togas, political divisiveness, religious scandal, and all the rest, 
all of it comes together in the pages of the book. Um, so um, just one last thing before I wrap up. Um, the press right now is having this big sale. So I just wanted to put up a note that if you order directly from UNC Press, um, you can get a 40% discount with this code. All of this is on the website. Um, it brings the cost of the book down to about $18, which um, seems pretty good. Um, and then also in case anyone has questions that I'm not able to answer tonight, please get in touch with me. This is my email address and I would love to hear from you. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and open it up for questions. I'm not sure I have a question. Please go ahead. I just wanted to compliment you. I thought that was one of the most interesting topics I've heard you speak on forever. It's <laughs> just great. Mm -hmm. Richard, I owe you such a debt for helping me out with the information about the assembly room. Um, I really, and I, you know, really, I owe you, you and Ronan both real debts and helping me do Portsmouth research. So thank you. You knew where to turn. <laughs> yeah, I do. No, and the best thing was that you got back to me in about an hour. I couldn't believe how quickly you got back to me. <laughs> uh, I do have one question. Um, the uh, silent movie industry uses a lot of gestures back in the in the old days, I was wondering whether they copied or knew of some of those justice in the 1800s and used them for the silent movies. Yeah, yeah that's such a great point. You know, I thought about that a lot, that, um, that now, of course, when you watch silent movies, they seem so overblown, you know, with someone pleading like this and, you know, the, uh, exaggerating their facial expressions. But I think a lot of that um, makes sense, given that people, actors were translating their, their postures and their gestures and their facial expressions from the stage to the screen. And, and they were doing so in a culture that really had um, a lot of debt to exactly this kind of catalog of of performance techniques that had lasted for, I mean, by the 1920s, it had lasted for at least a couple of hundred years. And so I think it's only later in the 1940s and 1950s when you really start to see people prize a, a, a different kind of performance of authenticity, of emotional mm -hmm. authenticity. But, but, you know, of course, our ideas about what makes a good actor and what makes a convincing performance of an emotion, that's culturally constructed too, right? And so one of the things I often think about when I think about these, you know, exaggeratedly um, sort of overblown performances in the early 19th century is that those gestures, those big emotions had to reach everybody in the room. And so if Ogilvy had 400 people in a room, which he did on a regular basis, people in the back row needed to be able to see those big emotions, even if they couldn't hear his voice, you know, even if the acoustics of the room were not very good. And so I think that in some ways, the, the what seems so, so theatrical a set of performance styles is really a reflection of how, you know, people had to fill up a big room uh, oftentimes instead of having a camera right up close in someone's face the way that we've become used to seeing. Hmm. Well, not only that, but uh, it had to substitute for dialogue. There was That's no right. So you had to use these uh, uh, big uh, gestures to convey, and it actually does convey the dialogue if the gestures are right. That's right. And, you know, I've become a really big fan of silent movies, and I find that the more I watch them, the less I find that style of acting exaggerated. I actually find it really touching. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a whole interior logic of a silent film. And once you start to 
break into that logic, you start to you start to see why someone's you know uh, doing this could bring an audience to tears. Um, it it is very much a kind of replacement for words. Carolyn, um, if you can see my notes, you've preempted my toga question. <laughs> uh, I, I will go back to question number one, which is, I double checked in, in A Nation of Speechifiers, you mentioned Ogilvy only once. Right. Like how do you go from that to writing a whole book about him? Oh, easy. <laughs> well, you know, um, I kept running across Ogilvy in that first book, and um, and yeah, I wound up. The first book was really focused on ordinary women and men and the way that they encountered public speech and sometimes engaged in it themselves. Um, and but I along the way, I found all these diaries in which people are describing seeing Ogilvy on stage, and. And so it had always been in my mind that I ought to know a little bit more about him. But um, yeah, at some point, I don't know, it was probably eight or nine years ago, I, I started sort of poking around to see what there was. And of course, you know, developing this project means that I've had infinitely more access to digital sources. And, and those sources really showed me that there was a pile of stuff about Ogilvy that really I just kept trying to figure it out and I can see I can see Claire's face here I remember talking about this project with her I mean when was that it was about eight years ago or so um, and I remember thinking that um, that that maybe I could write an article maybe there was enough here to write an article and so I wound up um, presenting it at the um, the Omohundro Institute's uh, colloquium. I, I, I cobbled together some writing for that. But, but by the time I pulled together my draft, I had almost 100 pages. And I realized that it didn't feel like an article anymore. It felt like something bigger. And so I started to describe it as a very slim book. Um, but I just kept finding that Ogilvy just managed to be everywhere at the right time. I mean, he wound up going to Kentucky during the course of his lecture career, partly because he wanted to wean himself off the opium, which he realized was really causing a lot of problems. But then while he was there, the War of 1812 broke out. He became very entranced by the rabidly, you know, war hawk and anti-British and anti-Indian messages uh, taking place on the Kentucky frontier. And he signed up. If there's anything that seems more ridiculous than this skinny 40-year-old guy signing up for the militia in Kentucky, I don't know what that is. But even that wound up being this really interesting story about the very unique dynamics of pro-war behavior in Kentucky, especially as compared to New England, which was much more skeptical of the War of 1812. There was a lot more pro-British sentiment. So there was just um, so much material that I found myself really, really entranced by. So um, yeah, it just, it never stopped. And, and then at the end of his life, um, he traveled back to England and Scotland and uh, tried to continue his celebrity career there. And, um, and that was also interesting. He just, again, seemed to always be at the right place at the right time, meeting people, um, even though his career there looked very different than it had in the United States. So, yeah, I mean, the more research I did, the more fun I had. Hmm. Claire. <laughs> well, thank you for such a wonderful, this is such a wonderful, like it brings me back. Anyway, thank you for such a wonderful talk, um, as always engaging talk. Um, I, so this is, this is, hey, be quiet. Sorry, my dog's bugging me for dinner. Um, uh, this is less of a question than I guess more of an observation that has a question in it. It just strikes me that like I really enjoyed hearing you talk about the way that he was supposed to electrify and bring and like like his oratory and his performance was supposed to sort of magically bring everyone onto the same page and there's this sort of, this is like not the right 
historical world word for it, but like co collective consciousness or something like that. And, um, you know, I've been like reading a lot and writing a lot on like um, slave revolts and things that just mobilize a group of people to sort of suddenly act all and be all sort of emotionally on the same page. Um, and like, there's a lot of writing that in like scientific circles, George, stop it sorry, and medical circles. And it seems like in this too, that there's just this sort of, the part of the wonder of, oh, is like, yes, I'll have like his escapades, but also like his, his really unique capacity to sort of just like draw everyone to produce the same emotions, which like, of course, we're familiar with, right? When we watch like Dances with Wolves or something like that. I don't know <laughs> why Kevin Costner is on the brain. But it just, I guess my sort of question, sort of observation is it seems like this is an age that's really obsessed with that. That it's like really obsessed with these yeah. capacities of like revolt, not revolts, but sentiments, emotions, these things that like sort of have this irrational capacity to get the group all on the same emotional page or get a whole group morale to like converge and convene around a course of action, whether that's that they're all like crying at the same time or are moved or are all sort of inspired regardless of their political affiliation. And I'm not talking about the American Revolution, I'm thinking more about slave revolts, to like join a revolt. It just seems like this is just an age that's obsessed with like group, group think and the sort of instigators of group think. So I don't know what <laughs> you wanna do with that, but it just, it's a striking thing to me. Yeah, and I'm not sure, I'll, I'll just keep thinking out loud here. And I think that there is a way that, um, Ogilvy, I don't think he ever expected to exactly convince anyone of anything. Um, and in fact, the way he designed his lectures was to be sort of, uh, to create a kind of dialectic. And so he would, he would um, take people down the road of thinking that we should feel sympathy rather than disgust for people with suicidal thoughts. And then he would go to thinking about the reasons why cultures need to condemn suicide and go back and forth and try to sort of move his, his audiences to, to understand both sides, you know? And so he wasn't trying to exactly make an argument, but in a lot of cases, like when he was talking about gambling, he did ultimately have to sort of come down on the side of opposing gambling. But I think that, um, but there, there is something about um, the way that he wanted to enchant people with, enchant people with reason. I mean, if that makes any sense. And so um, it wasn't, he, he was an atheist. That's one of the things that made him so controversial in some culture in some circles, but he, he nevertheless understood the, the power of sort of um, speech and the, the sort of onslaught of emotional ideas and poetry and everything to, to bring out this sort of enchantment in, in society, enchantment in thinking about um, democracy and thinking about secular matters. And so yeah, I, I do think that this, and, and throughout the antebellum period to a large extent too, there was this heady combination of reason with, you know, magical thinking that, that, um, that got combined in a really powerful way. Um, and that's, that's the thing I think that brought tears to people's eyes and goosebumps and, you know, all the other sort of rich descriptions of people's responses to his performances. Um, the, the, you know, they would describe him as being, um, as, as really enacting a kind of magic. And, and I think that conveys the, the sort of the way they felt stunned by what they felt. Yeah, it reminded me of like, uh, some students have written like recently on mesmerism. Like yes. it reminded me of like what I encounter like about mesmerism in a very basic way. Yes, so thank exactly, you. exactly, yes. Any more questions? Otherwise, I will say thank you, Carolyn. You did a fantastic job. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. And again, 
Um, I appreciate it in these crazy times when, you know, Netflix is the one source of comfort we have. So thank you for coming. And it's so good to see so many familiar faces. And I will say that I cheated and got an advanced copy of the book from Carolyn and it's fantastic. And so you should all get it. It's coming very soon. <laughs> thank you, everybody.